Hey folks, Cutman here, Cutman, at your services. How are you all? I hope you're doing very, very well. Now, guess what? We've got another unboxing to do. <gasps> on the back of a huge unveiling yesterday, and another huge unveiling later on today, hopefully, we have this incredibly mysterious package all the way from America. Look at this baby here, look at this, yeah. Now, if you've been keeping up with current videos, then you, you might already have a few ideas about this. My good mate, Zach, out there, he's a fellow, fellow aficionado of the military, of special forces, and uh, military history and all this sort of thing. Uh, as a, by way of a thank you for me reviewing the Rambo Heartstopper Knife from Sly's Last Rambo movie, Rambo Last Blood. A major disappointment, I think we all probably agree. But the knife itself, the Heartstopper, designed by Dietmar Pohl, who's done a lot of special ops weaponry as well, and movie knives, he and Sly came up with this design. So the contrast is gonna go glitchy, glitchy, because it's very, very dark at the moment. I've got every light going. But there's no light coming through that window there, because what's it doing? It's January, it's not snow, it's sleet and hail, and all those lovely things tumbling, hailing from the sky with almost, you know, high velocity precision. There's the knife that he thought, I've got off that. So I told him where to get these from, and I think he bought up all the stuff. <laughs> Did, didn't you, Zach? You were a bit overzealous there. But by way of thanking me for that, he sent me this. And this comes on the back of uh, him meeting Rob O'Neill. Robert, I think it's J O'Neill who was the, uh, the controversial SEAL Team 6 member that put the extra bullets into Bin Laden's head. Bin Laden in Abbottabad in Pakistan, in his little com compound there, his purpose-built compound, you know, actually you know, under house arrest by the Pakistani government, but really they were keeping him, oh God, let's just make sure, keep him safe. You know, like Gandalf and the One Ring, keep it safe, keep it secret because he was also acting as a bit of like a liaison for all the extremist terrorist groups in Pakistan and just over the border, of course, in Afghanistan. So better to keep him on side, as it were. Let's get off this uh, Nick Kershaw track and let's put on something um, Navy SEAL related. Here's a welcome to Benghazi from 13 Hours. They were ex-Navy SEALs uh, and other operatives there. But, so we met Rob O'Neill and uh, who'd just done, a, a, I think, a big book launch about his career and particularly about the operation, Operation uh, Neptune Spear, which took out Bin Laden. Neptune Spear, why? Because the Navy SEALs uh, insignia is Neptune's trident, the three prongs. So he says, holding five fingers up, the three prongs of, ne of Neptune's trident. Three, because it's the three uh, operational uh, duties air, sea, land, you know? But anyway, anyway, folks, I could be completely wrong. And the beauty of these mystery unboxing is that I could be massively wrong. I don't know what's in there. I've got, actually got no idea. I'm saying it's related to Navy SEALs, but it could be a big painting of Custer's Last Stand, which would be awesomely cool anyway. <laughs> or it could be Isandwana, where the Brits got massacred by the Zulus. So now, I'm not gonna use the heart stopper because that would just hack through this in seconds. This is uh, appropriate enough. It's, it's called, it's, it's, it's a seal. It's a proper like three and a half inch bloody seal on this to keep it so you can't bend it. He's written on it, please do not bend, thanks. You'd have to be Hercules to bend this. It's absolutely, it's completely, you could, you could use that as a foundation for a skyscraper. Skyscrapers. Hmm. A World Trade Center. Didn't a certain bit. Oh, by the way, Bin Laden's here. You know, I, I did manage to get a, a souvenir. I've got his head. The thing I think about Bin Laden is that, uh, and you know, I'm not going through the, all the conspiracies of 9/11 uh, because there's a lot, and there's a lot. There's a hell of a lot more to it than uh, we get officially told. Explosions down below in the foundations, building seven going up, you know, one tower coming down, reported on coming down when the reporter's standing there and it's right behind her. 
And then she and she's clearly told over her earphone, it hasn't come down yet. And then she goes and moves to stand in front of it. Oh, no way. The Pentagon, all the air. The US government was, you know, trillions of dollars in debt and they're about to be indicted and really put through the ringer in court. All the evidence was stored in Building 7, you know? And the team investigating happened to be the... The entire team investigating it was wiped out in that room in the Pentagon when that other jet airliner crashed in. All eyewitnesses saying, didn't see no plane. The explosion went outwards, not inwards. We walked out through the wreckage and there was no plane there. Shush, 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 shush. Whatever your views on 9-11, Bin Laden was a complete grey day. Not a twat. You've got twats in the world and you have cunts in the world. Cunts are far more spectacularly nasty and evil than twats. And, uh, yeah. Oh. I did think there might be something explosive in here at one stage. Let's just make sure there's, there's not, there's like... No, nothing else in there. That is super hefty, that. That must have cost a fortune, that packaging. But what we have in here, well, before I open this, um, I'll just explain about the twats and the cunt syndrome. The twat can be, anyone can be a twat, you know, like, oh, you just think, you could be a great person, but you could do something wrong one day, and like, you know, he's, I like him, he can be a bit of a twat, though, sometimes. He can say the wrong thing, and he takes a joke a little bit too far. But a cunt is someone that absolutely is all out, goes out to, you know, disrupt, destroy, and they just, there's no redeeming features to them at all. And Bin Laden was definitely in charge of a lot of very cuntish behaviour around the world. So, thankfully, he's gone. Now, so it's definitely, this is definitely a poster in here. Sorry, that's glitching out there. With my crazy chaotic contrast level on this camera, this all singing, all dancing, fantastic camera, which can do all sorts of stuff, but I, I can't work it. It can do loads, but I can't. I can't work it out at all. So, oh God. Now I've got to be, do you know what? Scissors would be the ideal thing. Or maybe the ski and do will, yeah. Okay, folks. Now this clearly is a poster or a photograph. Is it an incriminating photograph of me? So. Someday, someone's gonna do that, and I'll do a great big unboxing. I might even do it live, and it'll be me in the buff. <laughs> to be honest, all my bits have been seen a million times anyway, so it's not really that shocking. I'm unfailing, I'm unfailing. Is it gonna be the SEAL Team 6 photo? Is it? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what's gonna be. And before I unfail this any further and show you, uh, Zach has said there are some other photos to go alongside this, which he's going to send to me. But he's only going to send them after I've done this unboxing. Do you know what? It is now. At the time of recording this, it is quarter past nine on a Saturday morning. It has gone as black as the ace of spades out there. Whoa. Okay, okay, you guys are going to see it first. Because, Zach, I'm going to do the same trick I always do with all the canvas movie artwork that Steve 007 sends. I just hope. Okay, I'm going to glance to see if uh, it's upside down. I can't tell. <laughs> I genuinely can't tell. <laughs> it could be me so far. <laughs> I can see through the back of this. <laughs> there he is. X marks the spot. What's it say here? What's it say here? Kill man, you're never out the fight. The SEAL Team slogan. Sign. Rob O'Neill. 
Oh man, that is fucking awesome. Look at this. I mean, look at this cunt here. Look at this cunt. <laughs> well, as many of you know, I'm ex Royal Marines. But in the 80s, when I was a, a wee sort of 16, 17 year old, I was, um, I was about to join the US Marine Corps because during that phase, during that era, you could, a Britisher could join up in, in foreign forces, especially American forces, as a foreigner. And after four years of service, you become an automatic American citizen. And I was gonna do this. Now at the time, the US Marines were, were massively, heavily, um, entrenched in Beirut and lots of nasty things were happening it's all over the news all the time kidnappings and bombings and all sorts like and uh, US Marines getting taken out and in the meantime my, my dad the sadly now uh, you know deceased big kilt papa said it was a massive uh, British army you know expert and you know he'd, he'd force himself like he took out the uh, the Luftwaffe which were bombing Liverpool and the Birkenhead docks during the Second World War. As a kid, he was actually on the rocket batteries. He was too young to join you know, the army, but they put him in the home guard. The irony being the home guard is always known as being the old guys, but they took on younger people who couldn't get in to the army because they were too young and put them to service. And whereas in other parts of the UK, the home guard just, you know, at butties and, you know, met on parade in the village square. But here, we were getting blitzed like London. So my dad was on the rocket batteries and we have got pictures of him. Those little tiny, little tiny square, very yellowy sort of little pictures of him on the rockets, firing these rockets. So he did take out Luftwaffe at the age of 15. Anyway, but he said to me, oh no, don't be joining American forces. Join, if you're gonna join any forces, join ours. And then he had a bit of a change of heart. He didn't wanna see it. My older brother was in the RAF but didn't see any action anywhere. It was just pure ground crew. And um, although he did travel about a fair bit, but he said, don't, um, don't be sacrificing your life for anybody. Don't do it, you know. Do it, for, do it for a loved one, not a country. So he'd have me applying for jobs in the meantime. So I did get a job. I got a job in the civil service and ended up working in the, the Royal Liver Building, a prestigious landmark in the UK, of course, and especially proud thing for us people around here in Merseyside. And that's where I met my wife, Mrs. Kiltman. You know, she was my boss. So fate played a hand in that. But in later years, what I did, I joined the Royal Marine Reserves. And I did a few years with those, got fully qualified, did a bit, and, and did travel around a fair bit, and loved it. But Mrs. Kiltman fell very pregnant. And uh, then I decided, well, that was it for me. But I, in the time that I was there, I met Navy SEALs. I met lots of, I, I did exercises with the US Marine Corps. I met many Special Forces operatives, SAS, SBS is what I aspired to. It's what I wanted to do. But uh, sadly that wasn't to be. And in the end, you know, I, I don't have any regrets about any of that, but I've kept up a few contacts and I've loved, you know, the whole, the banter, the repartee and the camaraderie that you have with people like that. And, uh, there's a lot of things going on which I hear about, but I don't know enough to, I certainly wouldn't say anything about them anyway, but because uh, I still work for the government, hey, hey you know, in a, a secretive capacity. Hmm, isn't that intriguing? <laughs> Those of you know me go like, no, not really, no, I know what you're doing. No, it's an important job, but look at that. Rob, what you did there, bang, 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 bang. Now, I know there's conflicting stories as to exactly what happened once, you know, they went in via modified uh, Black Hawks. Night Stalkers took them in there. They flew right down to the ground to avoid the Pakistani, uh, you know, covert uh, operations, to avoid their surveillance is the word I'm looking for, and got into the compound, which they, the CIA had spent so long studying, so long, uh, although they'd never actually seen Bin Laden moving about, but they just thought that it's got to be him. And there was a courier, there was a known courier, he was interrogated and there's lots of like, you know, people like observing, you know, 
you know, movements and contacts and surveillance and you know, um, phone calls were monitored and all that sort of stuff. I mean, Bin Laden had been living in a cave. This would, this would be fucking luxury for him. He'd been living in a cave in Afghanistan for years, you know, pissing and shitting in a bucket, you know, and then probably rolling around in it knowing him. You know, dipping his, his kids' heads in it, like, oh, it's, it's, for, it's for Jehovah. Oh, come on, like, yeah, and Mohammed and all that. that okay. So, to get this would be luxury, but he couldn't go out the compound because he knew the Americans, the eyes in the sky were looking everywhere. So a lot of uh, painstaking covert surveillance took place to establish, look, well, it's got to be him. There could be, it's only one person that could be in there. They're going to do this kind of you know, security compound for. But with the ground sort of opinion in Pakistan, they couldn't just go in there as a military operation. So the Navy SEALs were actually uh, moved into the CIA temporarily to work for them. So it would be a covert black ops operation without you know the military sort of involvement. Shaky ground, it's definitely shaky ground. And they knew that as well because there was Chinook helicopters as well with more troops who were gonna be parked just down the road in case the Pakistani military got in there as well. They're gonna to have to try and fend these off. You had a dog hander and a dog. You know, the dog was meant to walk the perimeter and alert them in case the Pakistanis were coming up or anyone else was trying to come up. I think five people were killed. Uh, in, in the firefight going in there. One of the Blackhawks, again, you know, I'm not knocking Americans. I think the Americans are absolutely amazing. Um, having worked with them and known many, many American operatives, you are some of the best guys in the world. What lets you down publicly is the huge amount, too many chefs in the kitchen, too many chiefs running around the Indian tribe. So too many branches get involved in things. Being, having worked for you know, the British military and the British military defense, the civilian side of it as well, I can see how that, from the outside looking in, I can see why these mistakes get made. You know, the term clusterfuck does come in, and not being derogatory at all. The soldiers, the actual operators, know exactly what their job is, and they are trained to you know, unbelievable levels and their confidence, their integrity is second to none. Their ability and their skills are just unparalleled. What lets them down is the head shed and the too many sort of stuff that's got to go around, you know, to cover all this. Well, they're bringing these and we've got to have these as well. We need that kind of support. Aircraft carry, it's just it's too much goes in. So in many other occasions, sadly, there's been loss of life by accidents. Delta Force going into Tehran to rescue the, uh, the American students. First time the Delta Force had gone into operation, Colonel Beck, Beckwith's you know, dream trial, modelled on the SAS. Massive fuck up, they collided in midair, helicopters going down, all oh, special operations guys just flambéed on the deck, you know, and the Ayatollah Khomeini walking up and down, parading around these charred bodies. Sadly, it's happened a few other times as well. No, the, don't get me wrong, the Brits have fucked up a fair bit as well. Most notably, as far as I'm concerned, is Bravo Two Zero, because Bravo Two Zero was an Andy McNabb, not his real name, and not his real story either. Sorry, Dave, um, but when uh, that book was released, oh my God, I read that and I thought, okay, I didn't go in when I was a teen to the US Marines, but I'm gonna go into our Marines now, and I'm gonna work towards SBS. I'll do it. I'll, I'll go on as reservists, so I'll keep my occupation as well. I'm going to do this, do this, do this. And that was exactly my, my mindset. And that book definitely brought me into it. Like, But, you know, what, what, it's, it's been proved by many, and I know many people that were actually involved who said, you know, what he wrote there is pure propaganda. The true story of Bravo Zero has never really come out, but I know bits that which definitely did happen and... It's not at all why it's painted by the likes of Andy McNabb, you know, uh, ballistics and gunfire and strategy expert to Hollywood these days. Yeah, fiction factory. But uh, it was a great read and it read true as well. So it was a great recruiting campaign. You know, you think, how, how can like a military disaster where you end up going, escape and evasion, you all get captured, only one of you gets away, you're getting shot, you're getting killed, you get captured, tortured, you lose your fucking teeth for God's sake, one of you drinks fucking nuclear effluence and, and will have repercussions of that for the rest of his life. 
Uh, but hey, what a, what a recruitment campaign. Join up. Yes, this is what life's like in Special Forces. Wonderful. But it did work. It did work. You wanted that adventure. So, and um, if anything else, it did, or sorry, if nothing else, it did give me uh, that banter, that camaraderie with people that have really done fantastic, amazing things and have the scars to prove it. And that community is a wonderful, wonderful family to be involved in, which never goes, never, never leaves you. So, <laughs> but what we're saying is like, controversy follows every sort of operation like this. And the operation to take, well, not that witch out, but uh, Bin Laden, what could have been a bigger operation than that? Global interest in this. We got him, we finally got him, uh, but where's the body? Well, we, it's a burial at sea, but it's been identified by various m methods, including family members who were all there. Uh, I think five people were meant to have been killed in that firefight. Uh, but sorry, I was, I was talking about the, uh, the disastrous element to it. The first Black Hawk, because it's landing inside a compound and the temperature had gone up as well. And they, they trained in purpose-built camps around America, uh, mock-ups of what the compound would be like and trying to recreate the weather, how it would be there. And they've timed it to the exact moment. And uh, probably not much of a moon to be showing there, zero dark 30, it's going to be completely dark and all that. So down they go. And as it comes in, it gets like, what, an up, I think they call it an upwash or something like that. And the rotors can't do their downwash properly. And the temperature's gone too high. So it swings over and the rotors and the tail clip the compound wall on the inside, which flips. The Black Hawk, you know, even Black Hawk down, Mogadishu, ah, oh, Black Hawk, oh, Jesus, the, a, guy, a ranger that falls off the uh, repelling rope, you know, which is what causes the whole disaster in the first place. Because now you need to get ground crew in there, and oh, anyway, it's clusterful, you know. But Black Hawks, Night Stalkers, you're an amazing people, Navy SEALs, you're an amazing people, but this helicopter has to go over, so they can't get it out of there either. Only a few minor injuries are sustained by the crew on that and the SEAL team that are in there. But uh, they've got to destroy this bloody thing. Well, Rob O'Neill, and I forget the other guy's name, go in floor by floor. The CIA have blown all the electricity, so it's a blackout anyway, so the occupants can't see a damn thing. But Rob O'Neill and all his SEAL team uh, comrades have got night vision on. So in they go, and they're using the HK416, is it 416? Firing a 556 round, uh, they're going in there. They've also got all the side arms as well. I mean, they're, they're armed to the teeth and they're going to have knives, probably not the hard stopper, but they're going to have a decent pole survival knife on there, a combat knife. And uh, in they go and they take out all the members of Bin Laden's family. I think one of his, his adult but still young sons and a few, I think the courier was taken out as well, uh, or some, some, some other guy that was known. Uh, and yeah, and Bin Laden apparently wasn't armed at the time, but there were weapons in the room he was caught in. Uh, well, apparently they weren't loaded. But, uh, you know, the thing is, the operation publicly was, you know, it was kill or capture. If you can capture him, capture him. But unofficially they were told, fucking take him out. And of course, you're not going to do that. How could anyone withhold that rage? Whether you hold him responsible for the Twin Towers coming down, and many other atrocities. He has been involved in all of these things to some level. He is a massive, massive Islamic extremist bogeyman. You've got to take him down. He's a figurehead as well. Even though, you look, look at that face. Look at that face. It's not an evil face. You know, you think these guys are going to be like, arr, arr, like fucking bulldogs, here, spitting fire, and they've got horns and all sorts, like spikes growing out their cheeks, laser beams for eyes. They don't look like that. It's like mass murderers and serial killers. are actually fucking lovely people. Until they start chasing down the street with a fucking meat cleaver, of course, and then try and cut you up and put your bits in a fridge to, to cook you the next morning's breakfast. You know, but that's how people get away with it. They're charismatic. You know, they've got like an endearing quality which people warm to. And then, then they work on them and, you know, you know, bastardise them, radicalise. But look at Bin Laden. Bin Laden's got sort of this little soft little face, a little bit of a beard on him. Not one of the huge torpedo ones that the Taliban always sport. But uh, 
and he's got these sort of sad puppy dog eyes, little warm eyes. Look again, I'll look again. I'm not wrong. You know, he, he's got the little, the little smile. It does, it does not look like the evil scheming mastermind behind, you know, well, terrorism, bringing, you know, the Western, you know, governments to their knees. <laughs> but that said, he was a cunt. And Rob, although there's controversy over exactly who put those final shots in there, was it the first guy in and you, you pushed past him and put the shots down? Don't know, there's a, lo there's a lot of controversy. And there's also controversy about coming out and uh, writing your memoirs. If you're part of the Special Forces community, you're not meant to do that. Uh, you're not meant to talk about it at all in, in, in public, write your memoirs. And in the UK, you sign the Official Secrets Act. In the American uh, Special Ops community, it's a brethren sort of thing. It's a solid oath that you swear you're not gonna do it. But, you know, people need to know a lot of these things. So, although I understand operational secrets uh, must be kept, strategy, tactics, training, people's names, you know, a lot of stuff, information should be withheld. Of course, it's changed anyway. These accounts that people write in their memoirs, they're not exactly, we'll look at Andy McNabb, it, it was complete and utter uh, bollockerama. But even so, if it had been genuine, all those facts, all the real facts and the names would have been changed completely. Other bits of information would be changed and swapped and you just wouldn't be getting that full picture. Of course you wouldn't, and you've got to understand that. But Robert O'Neill come under a fair bit of flack. People were saying he shouldn't have done it, shouldn't have come out and said any of these things. Um, what was the other quote he said about like uh, rescuing Americans in Afghanistan? He said, like, I'll go in, I'll do it. I'll go and rescue any American and I'll do it by killing everyone and everything that stands between me and rescuing them. <laughs> Which is... And he meant, he meant it as well, he meant it. I think he said something like, um, someone's gonna correct me here, but I'm sure he said like, the reason why he left, you know, special was he wasn't frightened anymore. There was no, the adrenaline was still there, but he had no fear. And he said, if you've got no fear, and you go into a situation, well, you're gonna get yourself killed because you just think you're invincible. So you're forgetting all the actual training that you've had, and all, you're ignoring your, your, your instincts, you're going against it because you've survived so many other things and that thrill, that adrenaline rush just makes you think you're invincible. Well, that's not the way you, go, you operate. You can't work like that. So he, he made the right call there. Um, so it's a fascinating story, of course. And uh, in um, Catherine Bigelow's great movie, well, some would say great movie. I, I, think, I didn't think it was that good, actually. Uh, Zero Dark Thirty, which is based around the events of um, Operation. Uh, Neptune Spear. You had Chris Pratt, Chris Pratt was playing you, <laughs> Rob O'Neill. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> but uh, I, I like Chris Pratt, I do, but it, uh, I don't know. And I don't think, did he do a particularly good job? I don't know, I don't know. You'd have to you'd have to speak to me about that. I don't know. I thought Zero Dark Thirty was uh, a bit of a damp squib, really, to be honest. Um, but it could have been far, far better. But anyway, that, that's just my opinion. And I haven't seen it for a long, long time. Although I, I now feel the need um, to get inside that compound with you. <laughs> but here he is. Look at this. <laughs> and there's me thinking like, oh, it's gonna be like a, a bit of his piss and shit stained dish dash blood all over it, like, or fragments of his skull, some of his teeth hacked out, like, <laughs> I bet you've got some souvenirs like that, um, but that's fantastic, you never have to fight, you never have to fight, again, this is, I think this is Black Hawk Down we're playing here, um, there were seals on the periphery of that engagement, but it's mainly Delta Force and Rangers who were in there, but anyway, folks, I think you'll agree, that's a fantastic little uh, little piece. And there's, well, Zach, you've got photos which are gonna go alongside this. And it's probably, I'll make a guess now, it's probably Rob O'Neill signing it and doing that big fucking red X on Bin Laden's fizzog, you know. Oh, cheers, y'all. 
I think we'll end with Now, it is Delta Force, I know, I know. And it's Alan Silvestri's score for the Chuck Norris movie, The Delta Force. But it's so fucking gung-ho. It's so like, you know, it's gotta be done. That's fantastic, Zach, that's a great. It could, I really didn't know, I, I, I assumed it was Navy Seals, I assumed it was Rob O'Neill. Um, only way that we talk about this stuff, uh, and you didn't let me down. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic because it brings a smile to your face, you know. Like, yeah, he's it's not like a big, horrible shot of him, like this skull blown apart. It isn't that, which I still wouldn't mind seeing that to be honest. But uh, it's just like he's got the X factor right between his fucking eyes. <laughs> Outstanding, folks. Hope you appreciate that, Zach. Fantastic. I've got another, there's another uh, mystery unboxing to do later on. So, I have been always Shelby Kiltman. Always enamoured, always siding with special forces and the guys that go out and do the job itself. You know, politicians, all the crap that they go through, you know, all the hand wringing and the, then, you know, they get exonerated from all these sort of war crimes afterwards. But they send people in to go and do the job, you know, and then they make scapegoats out of them as well. Politics is bollocks. Guys on the ground are carrying out orders, and they do it, you know, with absolute, you know, integrity, sincerity, and when called for, unparalleled savagery. And that's what I love about it. Righteously justified in their actions, taking out complete cunts like him. So, folks, there you go. It's uh, from me and uh, Happy Larry here. <laughs> uh, we're going to see you all in a black ops scenario. Later. Cheers. You never have the fight.